uh, it was not bad in many ways. I definitely was getting a lot out of Morgan's uh, meditation there, but it was a, a useful, I think, way to lead into our conversation with Jeffrey Sachs in several respects. <coughs> One, the global approach, and I think for me, when I was thinking about what it is that I want to accomplish in coming years, it really is connected to why we asked Jeffrey to be here today. Uh, here at Techonomy, I would say we are worried, despite our optimism, despite our conviction that technology is a positive force, that the world is not taking its own challenge seriously enough. Um, and as we mentioned yesterday, the sustainable development goals are a big part of how we think about our own work and, and structuring it and structuring our thinking and our priorities. The sustainable development goals for the, the United Nations articulated 17 goals for 2030 that pretty much cover the full range of challenges facing the planet. Jeffrey is one of the architects of that, that set of goals with that approach and one of the great advocates for taking responsibility more seriously and, and being more methodical about how we address the challenges that we face. So welcome. Good morning. And, and you know, I don't know if I now need that you're also calm, I want to raise your stress <laughs> level again. <laughs> well, I Je promise to create a lot of anxiety in the next few minutes. <laughs> it it might be appropriate. Uh, Jeffrey's a professor at Columbia. He's an advisor to uh, the UN Secretary General. He's written a number of fantastic books. Um, he's he's uh, he. You created the Earth Institute, didn't you originally? Uh, I inherited it. You inherited. It. Okay. Well, yeah. you turned it into something huge, and you're you're still there, although you're not running it right. the whole thing anymore. But basically, a lot of your work is focused on how we can achieve the SDGs, the global goals by 2030. So talk about why that's such a priority for you. The basic idea is that we have uh, obviously the technology, that's what brings us together uh, here. We have the incredible affluence and we're blowing it. This is the simple point. Uh, we have made a world that is wealthy uh, and a world that is uh, really teched up and we're destroying the planet, we're nasty to each other, uh, we uh, have elected an idiot for president, uh, and that's a symptom of a society that's in deep crisis. Uh, so I really am here to raise your anxiety level uh, because things don't work on their own and we kid ourselves to think that things are fine. Of course, we're in the center of the greatest wealth uh, on the planet uh, in the few square blocks where we're meeting. We feel fine. If you're a highly skilled person, life seems probably better than ever as long as you can tune out most of the world's realities. Um, and our economic system does not solve problems like protecting uh, the planet from human-induced uh, global warming or human-induced destruction of habitat and biodiversity which have reached scales that if you're attuned to the scientists are completely unprecedented uh, in human civilization. And we've reached a level of uh, derangement of our politics which is so corrupt uh, and so money driven that we can't solve problems anymore. We can't even talk straight. Think of last night, how many things are we supposed to deal with? Uh, Israeli attacks on uh, Iranian positions in Syria, uh, absolutely against international law. Trump's uh, withdrawal from an agreement uh, endorsed by all other countries in the world or Michael Cohen receiving money from uh, Russian oligarchs into the account and duh, that's for consulting services. That guy's really a great consultant, we know, uh, if you want mafia services. Uh, so we're really in trouble, ladies and gentlemen. We are not in a good situation. Sorry. Uh, Okay, I'm that was a, even I'm always slightly in a bad, grimmer I'm, than I'm, I expected. I'm always, I'm always in a bad mood in the morning because I get up. Well, he read, had a big smile on when I he read, walked in I this read morning. The Wall Street, I read the Wall Street Journal filled with lies on the editorial pages, filled with bad news on oh, the very good news You should read the Financial Times anyway. I do also. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but, but so 
You did have a smile on. I so do. you must <laughs> not, you must not, you, you haven't given up clearly. That's nope. one reason you're here. Uh, the global goals are, you know, a very somewhat abstract set of targets, but is there, do you, what's the, what's the way you think about if you can be optimistic in the face of yeah. what you're saying, which I believe you to be in some fundamental way, is there a pathway that you can see, leave the goals even aside, just towards comedy and, and c you know, civility and, and, and collective commitment in general, which is something I think that so many of us, you know, mourn the absence of, and we, you know, if we didn't, care about it, we wouldn't be doing this conference. This is really a motivation for us. This is our small way of helping, but what do you think we could all do together to make things better? The reason I like these goals, and let me describe them uh, in a moment, oh, is Oh, there's still that some nat nature left. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? I <laughs> the birds. That oh, sorry. I was, I was just, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, uh, let me say why I, uh, it, it, not that I'm optimistic, but that I think we should uh, figure out a, a way out of uh, the very peculiar position that we're in and why I think these goals make a difference. Can't so the idea is basically this. Tell me so. We've got everything going for us. Uh, we, we really have created uh, an astounding uh, amount of know-how. Um, and obviously uh, the digital revolution that is really at the core of this meeting and the core of our world right now offers phenomenal solutions to lots of things beyond streaming movies or paying for advertising on, on the internet. Uh, we could really solve a lot of problems about low carbon energy, about protecting the biosphere, about monitoring uh, habitat, about making our cities like our wonderful New York City work better. So there's no reason at all for technological pessimism, this is for sure. There's no reason for economic pessimism in the sense that world output is now $130 trillion a year. That's a lot, by the way. Even for a macroeconomist used to these numbers, $130 trillion measured at international prices is a tremendous amount of productivity. What, was that about, what would that have been like 10 years ago? We've been basically achieving growth of 3 to 4% per year pretty consistently with the bad bump in 2008. But that means a doubling time every 20 years or so. So you can say that uh, 20 years ago we would have been roughly at half that and mm. uh, 40 years ago roughly at uh, a fourth of that level. That's a good growth rate. That means at, at that level of wealth, there should be no extreme poverty on the planet. Children shouldn't be dying of uh, poverty, as about six million do every year. Uh, we shouldn't be in desperation uh, over hunger. Uh, we should be understanding that we have the surplus we need to revamp our energy system, to get out of fossil fuels, to move to a renewable energy based system, which I issued, a, my group issued a report last week showing how New England and, and the US Northeast could basically become zero carbon uh, with smart grids and a good interconnection with the Canada and Canadian hydropower among other things linking up with our wind and solar here. So there are ways to solve problems. My uh, worry is that we don't solve problems right now, that our politics are profoundly corrupt. Uh, we have a pay-for-play politics in this country, even cruder than I imagined, because look at all the companies that paid Trump off uh, through transfers to uh, But I want to uh, get his, uh, No, but let me just say, <laughs> okay. this, no, but this is really important. We're, we're not solving problems in this country. But we how do we, we get there? We don't even think. Well, First, we have to call out the scoundrels. I guess that's true. We, we absolutely have to call out the scoundrels. And there are two kinds of scoundrels. One uh, is, of course, the politicians, uh, most of whom are one way or another on the take in our system. And second is the business sector, which in this city and to a large extent around this country is amoral or immoral in its practices, a lot of it because uh, 
the hedge funds or Wall Street or many other sectors don't care except for the bottom line. And so they're in this business and we keep seeing the revelations of this. Look at the oil industry. Look at David and Charles Koch. I was at the AMNH last weekend going through the halls of biodiversity. Well, okay, I can imagine them giving the hall of species extinction because they're experts in it. Uh, they're doing that. They're funding all of the anti-climate change uh, action in on the, the U.S. Senate. Hand, we and have then, Blackstone on the stage later today, and they're really trying to think differently and you know, take a step towards telling business they need to. So there are positive signs, right? Yes, there are some positive signs, and, uh, and I, I hope that uh, they follow through. I want all of you to follow through, though, to understand how serious our problems are, not because they're unsolvable, but because we don't try, and because we're absolutely locked in a cycle of greed. That's astounding. Uh, maybe it is, uh, with uh, Morgan, uh, the right starting point, which is that we is that her name? Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, that, um, what are we thinking? Uh, or are we thinking? Because we have a serious need to make a number of changes. Why is it that we gave a tax cut of $2 trillion last December, and now yesterday the White House uh, calls for $15 billion of cuts, including the CHIPS program, uh, child health for poor kids? Are we out of our minds? Is, the, is there any limit to the cruelty of Mr. Trump, who is a clinical psychopath? I'm sorry to say it. He, but and, really. The thing, the This thing, is important because we have a, I'm sorry, but we have a president I don't think who, anybody needs to be convinced know, that Donald Trump's a little bit unbalanced. No, I mean, but, but I or, think. Or a lot, but, but. I think the important the question point is, what do you is, do about it? Right, so the reason there are goals is that we need to orient ourselves towards what's important. And what the Sustainable Development Goals call for are clear metrics for the U.S. and for every other country by the year 2030. They call for decarbonizing the energy system. They call for protecting habitat. They call for reducing inequality. We have the highest inequality in our modern history in this country, measured by the Gini coefficient and other technical measures, the Palmer ratio and so forth. They call for safe water. We can't even get safe water in the United States anymore. Can you imagine? And it's not just Flint. It's hundreds of cities around this country. We can't take seriously the fact that large parts of our country, including Manhattan, are going to face massive crises from sea level rise this century if we continue the way we're continuing. And we have a political system designed right now to ignore all of that. So the idea of the goals is you read them, you look at them. If you are like me, which is an academic, you study pathways to achieve them. If you're in business, you say, how do we align with them, not how do we spend all our time lobbying against them. This is the future we need to make. How could technologies address these issues? That's where I find the most interesting thinking. Well, well luckily, we have a major corporation, Novozymes, on stage in just a few minutes that is specifically thinking about how aligning its own yep. strategy towards the global goals makes sense, even from a standpoint of growth and profit for themselves, uh, and certainly with the benefit of the planet. But. Um, So, so, I mean, I think it's, a, it's appropriate that we should be worried. That's why we put you on the cover of our magazine. And, but I will say that I, I am struck now, and I was struck when we sat for two hours at your apartment not too long ago, with the gravity of your concern, even though I know, because it seemed, uh, for years, even, for several years, Techonomy opened with uh, showing uh, the, uh, uh, gapminder.org data that is to show that you know for all of the things we worry about the basics have been getting better on the planet for a long time infant mortality you know 
lifespan has been lengthening on a global basis. Average global wealth is, as you pointed out, has been growing. And, and, and many of the measures, even as applied to individuals, have been getting better and better. So it's clearly, there are good things happening in, in the context that we may be destroying the environment in which we live, which is obviously of great concern. I, I don't know why I'm going through that, except that yeah. I, I, I just want you to factor in the positive growth. And I mean, I guess I'm just trying to get you to tell us a way to address this without a fatalistic sense of fear. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that all of these uh, analyses, um, including Steven Pinker's new book uh, about all of the progress, are basically a bit of a misunderstanding. And the way I think is right to understand it is what President John F. Kennedy said at his inaugural address in 1961. He said, uh, the world is different now, for mankind holds in his mortal hands the ability to end all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And that is the most succinct definition of our existence in the modern world trying to tally up the positives and say the world is great is a mistake. Tallying up all the negatives and saying the world is lost is a mistake. Rather understanding that the world is, uh, uh, is a choice for us. We face choices uh, every minute. We, yeah. we face choices uh, individually, but now we face collectively a choice yeah. because the problems that we face are global. Uh, they have nothing to do with a trade war or a hundred billion dollar imbalance with China or ripping up a, uh, a uh, carefully negotiated agreement with Iran. Uh, these have nothing to do with our real problems, nor are our problems properly measured by whether the unemployment rate is 3.9 percent today or 4.1 percent or whether the Dow is at 24,000 or 26,000. We're living in a world uh, where all of these short run bombarding signals are a distraction from some quite fundamental issues. We're seven and a half billion people on the planet. We'll soon be nine billion people. We're in the middle of an unprecedented derangement of the physical environment in three fundamental ways global warming, loss of species, and massive chemical pollutants all over the planet, ocean and terrestrial. We have uh, such a derangement of our mentality and our political system, which has been taken over by money everywhere, that multiple uh, leaders around the world are uh, in jail or should be in jail, our own included, I'm quite sure. Uh, if uh, this uh, investigation uh, it uncovers the kinds of evidence that uh, we learned about last night. And we are um, therefore really in need of some anchors of what we should be doing. For 15 years, I worked on what were called the Millennium Development Goals, which were goals to address extreme poverty. I can tell you the funny experience, I fought like hell and strangely enough made progress with the George W. Bush administration, which at the time I regarded as the worst presidency of modern history. Now it looks phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> but uh, W. put in money into fighting AIDS and malaria. Strange, by the way, uh, it made a huge difference. Uh, as I predicted and as others predicted, we saved millions and millions of lives. Then couldn't even get Obama's attention, by the way. So weird, uh, just to tell you how strange uh, every, everything uh, really is uh, in our politics right now. So I'm, I'm not especially partisan. I just don't like the whole thing for the moment. Do you think uh, there's some point in maybe having a, you know, the Paris Accords are one thing, but do we need to have some kind of global coming together to try to address this? You know, it's well, we do, by the way, we did. And we had two of them. One is the whole world agreed on, we, we've had three 
global comings together. We, one was uh, the sustainable development goals. All 193 governments agreed after three years of detailed work. Every day, three years, they agreed on 17 goals. Of course, most people never heard of them, don't know about them. Uh, I'm trying to keep them a secret from Washington because uh, Mr. Trump would bomb them if he knew about them. Uh, second was the Paris Climate Agreement, 10 years of work, at least one could even say 23 years of work because the Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in 1992. Kyoto was negotiated in 97, but the U.S. Senate, in its wisdom, never ratified it. 2009 was an attempt to negotiate so-called Copenhagen Agreement that failed. So in 2015, we finally got a climate agreement. And then our corruption of the Koch brothers, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, they get us to pull out immediately. That's not even Trump, by the way. That's just the Republican Congress, which is so corrupt and so much on the pay of the oil industry, they can't even, wouldn't even utter an honest word about climate change. They are not as stupid as they look. They are so corrupt that they will never say an honest word about climate change. So that was the second meeting. The third was to try to stop a war in the Middle East. And that was a universal agreement that Trump pulled out of yesterday. So we meet a lot globally. We actually agree on things globally. Yesterday's agreement is not a bilateral agreement between the US and Iran. It is a global agreement. Mm. It was reached by not only every member, permanent member of the UN Security Council, also the Security Council, also all the UN membership. Trump is nuts, sorry to tell you. And the fact that it's globally agreed is the reason to pull out because it's an affront to his megalomania, as well as, of course, to his various US client states or so-called allies in the Middle East like Saudi Arabia and Israel. I want to get the audience's wanna, help which, to ask Which want to have a war. <laughs> so we have, ladies and gentlemen, we have global agreements. We actually have a world a few blocks from here is the United Nations. It's a wondrous institution. Wondrous. It keeps us alive if it works. Yeah. It was the greatest invention by the greatest American president, FDR. And it works, and it's in our neighborhood. And we're doing everything to destroy it in this country right now, including with an incredibly nasty ambassador who lectures the others that we pay money, you don't vote with us, we're not getting our returns. That's wonderful diplomacy, I can tell you, Madam Ambassador. Mm. That's how you're gonna win votes, by telling them you're on our take, well, it doesn't work in this world. A little respect might work. A lot so, of what you're saying is agreed by many of the other countries, luckily, I think. I mean, so agreed by all of them. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I, no we're, we're right now 192 against one. Yeah. Okay. Look, can we get the <coughs> lights up? Okay. Let's get the mic right here. Are you happy yet? <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Oh. I'm actually not. Well, yeah, I am. Because we get the house lights up? I am. I am pretty agitated. <laughs> We, we should have done that in the afternoon, I guess, uh, not the morning. But I'm Veni Malkowski. I'm uh, spending most of my time at the UN representing ICANN as the UN engagement uh, Wonderful. VP. And I wanted to ask you actually uh, to bring it a little bit to the tech part of the conference. Uh, what do you think could be the role of the UN in all these tech agreements? And, you know, they talk a lot of in the last year, the new Secretary General has been talking a lot about frontier technologies and the UN role. And, you know, there is a lot of conversation going on within the UN system. Do you see any particular place for the UN within the tech? Let me say where I see the role of tech in these problems, which is that if you take any of the problems that are identified in the sustainable development goals, I mentioned several of them, transition to a low carbon economy, universal access to health care, universal access to education. Every one of these needs tech in a serious way. There's been lots of mapping of things that could be done. 
If you want to get kids in school, there's nothing more wonderful than the connectivity right now. Curriculum online, classrooms where there are no teachers, uh, raising uh, access of children to educational materials. If you want health care, I can tell you from personal experience, uh, there's nothing more wonderful than this and a community health worker and a backpack filled with the right medicines because you'll save millions of lives. Very interestingly, quickly, our partner Johnson & Johnson has a pro project in South Africa for pregnant women and new moms where they answer their questions on SMS yes. and they, they've just, I think, I just heard the other day, it's the largest digital health program in the world and most mothers in South Africa are now using it and it's a catalytically tr transformative thing. So these things can work. This is extremely important. What's the problem? The problem in general is that we're not creating the content or operating at scale because for most of this, it's not a business model. There are two meanings of business model. The meaning I like is business model means that you're running things in an organized, rational, <laughs> scaled manner, uh, procedures work, you have the feedbacks, you have uh, metrics, you have measurement. The other is it's for profit and your quarterly shareholder report is going to report. The market economy works fine. It's very impressive for solving certain problems. It has gotten you movies streamed real time on your phones or your devices. It's really good at that. The market's good for many other things as well. The market is not good for poor people. The market is not good for nature. The market is not good for other species. And to think so is a category derangement. It's a basic misunderstanding or that you were in a lousy economics class, and not mine. And, and, and the point I'm making is the following. There are things that will not come from businesses solving problems on a market basis. And we cannot accept that in this country because we don't want to accept that because the businesses only want to make money. And when I go to these businesses, they, oh, yeah, really important, but you're in the wrong place. Like when I asked Facebook about helping with education. Basically, I was let out the door. Why are you here? I said, because you connect the world. Yes, well, we're not interested in education. That's not Mark's, uh, that's not Mark's priority, I was told. Yeah, I said, but it's Mark's responsibility. No, nah, but it's not Mark's priority. Why don't you go to Washington to get this done? I said, why, don't, really you, what they I said, why don't you pay your taxes? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and then we can go to Washington. And then I was let out the door. So come on, this is the problem. The problem is the UN has no money and it has no technology. It is the meeting place to solve problems. But the business community wants profits and governments give away all their tax revenues to the rich everywhere in the world and then say we have no money for aid. We can't even manage. You know what we give in this country right now? 0.16 of 1% of our income. We spent 50 times that on the military. And we're trying to cut aid even more because aid's a waste. Aid is, you know, it's not America first. So this is the real problem. The UN don't look to it for the money. Okay, uh, I'm gonna get another question, yeah. Jeff. Uh, okay, back here, the cameraman has a question, please. Uh, Hi, I know this is a little unorthodox. Um, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> y you mentioned um, um, a universal health care. Yesterday we saw from a uh, presidential candidate uh, recommending a UBI. Another big uh, policy position that's getting traction is a jobs guarantee. Um, I know that you were a big supporter of Bernie in the primaries, and I'm sure that you know his chief economic advisor uh, was a proponent of MMT. 
I uh, know your background's probably Keynesian, but do you uh, are you familiar with modern monetary theory and um, how it relates to those uh, policy positions? Yeah, well, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> we have good camera people. Excellent. Get a close-up right now. <laughs> uh, look, the, the truth is uh, there is a basic uh, concept in politics, uh, which has been around about 100 years, called social democracy or social market economy. And the idea of social democracy or social market economy is that you have a market system, but you ensure people's needs, and you ensure that inequality doesn't get out of control. And there are a few places on the planet that follow that model, and uh, the main ones are Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, Denmark. Germany also, to an extent, has a social market economy. Yesterday I was in Canada. Canada is much more social democracy than the United States, though somewhere in between, say, the Scandinavian model and the U.S. model. This works. It's basic. We actually were going in that direction in the 1960s. This was from the New Deal through uh, the New Frontier, uh, through the Great Society. Uh, we turned away from that starting with Nixon and then especially with Reagan. That's when our great divergence came. Uh, it is arguably uh, linked to uh, signing the civil rights laws of the mid-1960s when there was the uh, uh, anti-civil rights rebellion of the U.S. South and the shift of politics to uh, the right wing uh, and to uh, the conservative white right. and. Um, we diverged in this country from these basics. So you don't need to invent a grand new framework that doesn't exist any place on the planet. If you're in Sweden, no matter what job you have, you have several weeks paid vacation, you have a year of uh, maternity leave. Uh, if you're a father, you have nine months of uh, paid leave. Uh, you have free health care. you have free tuition. You pay a lot of tax and you get a lot of benefits. And if you read the report that I issue every year with others, the World Happiness Report, you rank at the top of the world in happiness. If you're in the United States, uh, you see that unlike the progress you mentioned, we've had life expectancy falling in the, the last United States, two years the in the United the, States, yeah. life expectancy falling. We have a massive epidemic of uh, massive depressive disorder in this country. We have a massive epidemic, obviously, of opioids. We have a massive epidemic of metabolic disease because we have a food industry absolutely out to kill us uh, and killing us uh, because uh, that's our fast food industry. It's addictive, uh, it's uh, profitable, and it's killing us. And this is the difference of our country and Others, we don't need to invent a utopia or to dream or to overthrow a market economy. We just need to be sane again. We need to be moder moderate again. We need to be goal-oriented again, decent again, honest. And then we can get somewhere. Well, I, I hope you've helped push us more towards sanity because I pretty much agree with everything you've said, but it's a little depressing. No, but we'll get there. Um, <coughs> All right, thank, you so thank, you so thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you.